Hey guys, Prowl1701 here, and today we are going to be reviewing Creature from the Pit. And I have to start off by talking about episode 4 and how it surprised the heck out of me, because I really liked episode 4. Especially coming off that episode 3 had disappointed me, I was surprised. But I have to say, like, the first 7 minutes or so of episode 4 are amazing. And a lot of this is down to Tom Baker. All of the actors right here in this one scene, right at the beginning of the episode, do a great job. They're all on point. They're all doing exactly what they need to do. They're performing their characters perfectly. But Tom Baker is on fire here. This is some of the best. I mean, Tom Baker's always amazing. But this is another one of those moments why, when people are like, why is he the best doctor that I can point to and go, his little speech here in Creature from the Pit is amazing. The way he commands the room here and takes control of the situation and is in control of the situation is fantastic. I love everything going on here right at the start of the episode when the creature gets the little translator device on it so they can talk to it. And I love the idea that it uses people's own voice box to talk through them so it can communicate. So during the course of the story, we hear it talking with Tom's voice, with Lala's voice, and even with K-9's voice, which is kind of weird because he doesn't have a voice box. But we'll let that go. I love everything here. And then learning about the relationship between the creature and uh, Andrasta, whatever her name is, Andrasta. I can't remember her name. She's got a weird name. Uh, the Queen. <clears throat> learning about how they met. And when he learns about the trade agreement of how this planet is mostly forest and weeds and their planet has a lot of metal and they want to exchange. And I really love when Tom puts it together and he starts his little speech. Usually about the three minute mark. The three minute mark to about the six minute mark in the episode is just a masterpiece. When he's talking to her and it's like, there's nothing on this planet but weeds, weeds, forest, and weeds. I love when Tom Baker gets that uh, in his voice. You know, I doubt it, Morbius. He doesn't do it often, but when he does, he commands your attention. He commands the room. There is no Charles. Weeds, weeds, forest, and weeds. I love that. I live for those Tom Baker moments. Um... You know, you have to master the force, but you can't master the force without metal. You don't have a bunch of it. I love how he's calling her out and exposing everything she has done and everything she's given up for her own petty powers. He even points that out. Are you going to listen to this? You know, if you know, do what she says because she tells him to kill the doctor and you'll doom yourself to a thousand years of another dark ages. And I love that bit about, are you going to listen to these... Uh, pitiful power ravings of this pathetic woman, the way he says that this pathetic woman. Oh, man, he's not holding back. Have a care, doctor. You have a care. Put your people first for a change, or whatever it is he says there. No, I'm trying to remember the line. He goes, she's like, have a care, doctor, and he's just like, you have a care for your change. Care about your people for once. I love that line that he says there. That whole bit where he is tearing into her and exposing her for the petulant child that she is because that's what she acts like when she starts getting angry there she starts getting loud and shouty like a child and the way she, when she's doing her finger like this like a child or someone not getting their way is doing he exposes her for that whereas he means he remains calm and in control of the situation and for me anytime you're in an argument if you really want to truly win an argument Losing your temper and calling somebody a bunch of isms like a bunch of these people who get mad if you insult the 13th Doctor over anything. Any criticism over the 13th Doctor and they call you all these kinds of isms and you're racist, you're sexist, you're misogynist, you're, you're whatever. They're the, they're the Andrastas of this situation or whatever, Andrastas or whatever her name is. That's them. But which if you can calmly respond to that with reasons like... My, when I did a video talking about why I thought the 13th Doctor was a failure, it's 40 minutes long because I gave reasons for why I felt that way. And that's what the Doctor is doing here. Every single thing she is saying, he has an answer for. He has a... a, a I, I don't want to say a comeback because that's not right. But he, he has a logical, calm response to. Like an adult having an adult conversation and exposing her for what she is. And... It's not just the speech he says there, a lot of that, like when he's talking to her, 
when he when he talks about how the creature, she's like, you know, Doctor, you need to kill the creature. And he's just like, no. I like how he just flat out tells her no. And then when he threatens the seer guy, he's just like, mm, I have to weigh that against you know, two planets here. And I love what he says about, you know, and it came here to trade with you. And who's the first person it met? And the seer's like, the person who had the monopoly on metal. Yes. And did she put the concerns of her, you know, poverty-stricken people above her own petty power? No. I love the way he says that. No. And he exposes all of the, everything he says there in that scene is amazing. I'll put it this way. I watched the first seven minutes all the way up to where the queen died. And then I immediately, even though it was the first time I was watching this story ever, I immediately started the episode over and watched that again because I loved that scene. And I love the fact that the doctor taking control of the room, he actually persuades the people on the queen's side to join him, like the handler who controls the weeds thing. He starts siding with the doctor, first by just wanting to hear what the doctor has to say and refusing to kill him. No, let's hear what he has to say. And then even by sticking the weed things on her to where she has to go over and communicate with the creature. I love that Tom Baker sways her minions to see his side of things. I love that. That is the doctor. That is why when people are like, who's the best doctor? I'm like Tom Baker. And one of the things I can point to is this scene. That's the doctor. The doctor is never a character that should be on the back foot. And that's always been my main issue with 13. In that video I talked about, that was my main problem. She's playing catch up too much. The doctor is someone who's in control of the situation. And he is on fire in this scene. And I know I've talked a lot about that seven minutes, but I love that. So much. And I think the biggest disappointment is, to me, <clears throat> is I've never heard of you. I've never heard anything about this before. I have never seen anyone talk about this on the boards. I've never seen anyone talk about this in a YouTube video. Granted, I've never watched a review of this story because I didn't want to spoil it. But I've never heard anybody talk about this. I've always heard about the infamous scene from episode three that's, well, you know the one I'm talking about. But I've never heard about this. And that is sad because it's such a good scene. It's one of the most underrated scenes I've ever seen in Doctor Who. And I think you guys know I watch a lot of Doctor Who. But I cannot, cannot express how underrated this story is because of that scene alone. That scene, I will stack up with Heaven Sent. I will stack up with Genesis of the Daleks. I will stack up with the Caves of Androzani. Not the whole story, but those three, four, five minutes right at the beginning of the story, from about minute three to about minute six, I will stack that up with one of the best speeches and lines of dialogue the Doctor has ever had. Your Doctor Falls speech, I'll put this up against it. Your Zygon Inversion speech, I'll put this up against it. Your Do I Have the Right? Now, I'm not saying they would win, I'm, or I'm not saying it would win compared to those, but I am saying it deserves to be in the conversation. It is a great section of dialogues. It, it's kind of a speech, but it's, there's other people talking too. But it deserves to be in the conversation. It's it's really good dialogue, and Tom Baker delivers, delivers it perfectly. And another thing about this episode I wasn't expecting was the queen, uh, the Andrastar, Andrastar, whatever her name is, weird name, um, was I didn't expect her to die so early. She dies like seven minutes in. And when it first happens, when the creature or everything rolls on her, I'm like, is she dead? Is she like dead dead? Is she like really dead? And they're like, she's dead. I'm like, what? It, how, how much time is that? Is seven minutes in? What are they going to do for like the other 17 minutes? Did not expect that to happen because she kind of struck me as the main bad of the story. So that really took me by surprise. I was curious how they're going to fill out the rest of the story. Now, uh, one thing I didn't really care for in the story as a whole was the bandits. I liked them in episode one because they give Romana... Uh, that really great chance to shine like she does in episode one when she takes control of that situation in episode one like a time lord or time lady should and uh basically controls the room and convinces them to let her go kind of what the fourth doctor does here at the beginning of episode four is what she does at episode one and so i like them being there so she can have that moment but i never really liked them over the rest of the story especially the guy playing <clears throat> the leader of the bandits i never really cared for him his acting just I don't know. I felt like I was watching an actor, not a character. I didn't really care for him when he got stabbed. I was kind of like, oh, good. 
Um, I like how they leave it very ambiguous as whether or not the creature is good or bad for just a little bit. They kind of leave that up in the air. It kind of had me wondering, okay, with the queen already dead, are we going to find out that the creature is not everything it's saying it is? And it does just for a little bit kind of have that up in the air where even the doctor's thinking about that in the story. That's why he takes its little warp drive or whatever it's called. I like that bit when Romana's talking to him. He's like, yes. She's like, da-da-da-da, yes. Da-da-da-da, yes. There's some great little Douglas Adams askew humor there, which I like. I like the, I really like season 17, Tom Baker and Fourth Doctor. I love the, the wittiness he has in all of these stories. Um, so finding out whether or not the creature is really good or really bad, whether it has ulterior motives and whether, whether it's, um, um, you know, evil or not, that, that was really neat and kind of had me, uh, focused on the story, paying attention because I kind of wanted to see what else was going on there. And then finding out that it actually is good, but its own people had sent the star coming in, which, you know, that kind of came out of nowhere. I'm like, a star coming? Okay. But I like that. And the fact that Creature's willing to help, but then they have to go get the drive back. And I like the fact that Tom Baker knows exactly where to go because Romana had already been there. So they realized the bandits took it. And Romana's like, hey, it's over here. You know, That's pretty neat. I love the scene when they're stopping the star. I actually think the effects on that work pretty well watching it. You know, at first I was thinking, I wonder if this is a story that'll ever get like updated effects or something. But having watched it, I think the effects hold up pretty well. I'm glad they went with Nightmare of, Nightmare of Eden for the updated effects. It needed it more because the effects here work really well when the TARDIS is in that yellow glow, like that's on the cover of the box set, actually, uh, the back cover. And then the stars here and you see the TARDIS kind of pulsating. That works, but I really like when they're in the TARDIS and it has that kind of shimmer effect that starts getting progressively worse as they're using it when they're locked, when they've got it in that tractor beam or that gravity beam or whatever it is. That's a pretty neat effect. It works really well and how it gets more distorted right before the TARDIS circuit shorts out. That's really neat. I'm really buying it. And then when the TARDIS circuit shorts out and the camera tilts and the way the sparks fly out, that's actually really well done. I was sitting here thinking they don't need to do updated effects for this. These effects work really well. Considering the budget problems this story has, which is evidence, you know, like by the creature and stuff, I think it pulls that scene off really well. I was really impressed with it. And then I like the ending when they, when, you know, the guy's predicting he'll see something tall and dark. He's like, tall, dark, and Tom just walks out, and handsome. More of that Tom Baker wit I like. Um, fourth Doctor wit. I enjoy that being sprinkled across stories in this season. And then the guy... Um, uh, you know, when the guard says, hey, this is a chart treaty for this, he says it under his breath, and the guy acts like he's predicting it. How did you know that? When he obviously just heard him whisper it, that's that's how a con man works. <laughs> Ask the mentalist. Um, I enjoyed the story overall. I think it's underrated, I, which is true of a lot of these stories. You know, I thought Nightmare, Nightmare of Eden was underrated. I definitely think Horns of Nymon is underrated. It's objectively bad, but it's it's that camp panto bad that I like. Uh, and this one, I think, is underrated. I think episode three is the weakest of Creature, especially from that one notorious scene. It's, ooh. I think the production values hurt it in terms of the Creature. I do love the pulsating green effect and the fact that it does pulse at times, you can see it in that one scene at the beginning of episode four that I raved about so much, you do see it kind of pulsing in and out. That kind of helps a little. But I think if you can overlook the bad uh, the bad budget, much like Nightmare of Eden, there's actually a really good script there. And the dialogue is, I really enjoy in it, a lot of it. Um, and that one scene at the end is just so underrated. It is... Basically six or seven minutes of amazing Doctor Who right there. And then the rest of episode four is really good. The story finishes strong. It's kind of like the opposite of the Hand of Fear. Because Hand of Fear is a good story, but episode four is definitely the weakest. It does kind of putter out. Now, the ending scene with the Doctor and Sarah is great. But the whole episode four itself doesn't live up to the first three episodes. This is kind of different than that. Whereas the first two episodes, I think, are pretty good for Creature. And episode three, it falls off a bit. Episode four is definitely the strongest. And 
that matters to me. If your first episode is strong, I'm going to appreciate the story more. So and I really like that fourth episode, especially with that first seven minutes really getting me fired up so much I had to go back and immediately rewatch it. And then when I finished the episodes, I went back and watched about four of those seven minutes again, like from minute three to minute seven, again for a third time. Right before I started this review, I went back and watched it again for a fourth time. I love that. I still have it pulled up on my TV right there. I loved that dialogue. Yes, <laughs> this pathetic woman. I love the way Tom says that. Oh my God. It's just, it's such good dialogue. Yeah, I like this story. Season 17, just as a whole, strikes me as being massively underrated. And the funny thing is, is season 18, I feel the same way, and they're drastically different seasons. I don't know if you've ever had two seasons, two consecutive seasons in Doctor Who that are so drastically different. I mean, 22 and 23 are pretty different, and 23 and 24 are pretty different. But man, 17 and 18 are so tonally different from each other. But I find them both massively underrated because I really enjoy season 18. And now that I've seen all of season 17, I can say I really enjoy season 17. I don't think it has any just flat out bad stories that I just don't want to watch. I mean, every story in season 17 is 10 times better than Power of Kroll at least. I do think that at this point, that's probably the only Tom Baker story that I just can't stand is Power of Kroll. I don't really like The Leisure Hive much either, but it is watchable. I can go back and rewatch it. Um... But I don't think there's any of them in this season that I just would say I don't like. Uh, all of them at least have a nice rewatchability. I enjoyed Nightmare. I like Horns for reasons I've already explained. I enjoy this one. The final episode's really strong. Uh, of course, I love Shada and City of Death. They're just both amazing. And then even Destiny, while I find it a bit mediocre, it has a strong rewatchability for me. So this season is actually really good. Um... I enjoy everything going on in Creature. I like the little seer character. I like the queen. I like how she's played and how the way she's played kind of changes over the course of the story, of the story to where at the end she is very much acting like that little petulant child. Uh, the actress does a really good job there. Um, now everyone. I like the way everyone plays their parts in it. I think this is I think it's an underrated story. And I really am disappointed that I have never heard anyone talk about those six or seven minutes at the beginning of episode four. I mean, go watch them if you haven't watched them. And just, it is so, so good. It's a perfect example of the Doctor being the Doctor and of why the fourth Doctor is one of the best Doctors. The way the actual dialogue is so good, the way he delivers the dialogue is so good, and the fact that it commands the room and even sways the Queen's people onto the Doctor's side. That is the way to have a persuasive argument that people in the 21st century, especially young people, need to learn instead of just screaming and calling people every, every sort of isms just because they disagree with you. That is not the way to have discourse. This is the way to have an actual debate and discussion, the way the Doctor does it in this story. And I cannot overstate how much I love that scene. Uh, go watch it. Um, yeah, it's a good story. I, I enjoy it. Uh, episode 3 is kind of weak. Some of the production values really hurt it. But the script is definitely there. And it's I, there's several other stories in Classic Who that don't aren't as good as this one, in my opinion. So that's my thoughts on The Creature from the Pit. I would like to know what you think of this story and what you think of that particular scene I keep raving about. If you haven't watched it in a while, I'd really love for you to go back and watch that five, six, seven minutes and then tell me what you think of it with fresh eyes. Other things to do, click the like button, click the subscribe button, click the bell for notifications so you never miss out on another video. I also have a Patreon. If you like what I do and would like to contribute to what I do, there is a link to that down in the description below. My entry level tier is only $2 a month. I want to give a shout out to two of my top tier patrons, The Fifth Doctor and Stephen Crane. I really appreciate their continued support, just as I appreciate the support of all of my patrons. I also have a P.O. Box. If there is anything you would like to send me, Doctor Who related, sci-fi related, or otherwise, that is also in the description below, as is a link to my Amazon wish list with some neat stuff on it. Uh, most importantly, though, thank you for watching.